Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and welcome to the show. Today is the first day that Chili wakes up and he's in protective custody. Now, you got to keep in mind that when he came into the prison system, he was a scared young man. He had just gotten 40 years. He had just gotten 40 years committing a crime that he only committed because he felt ashamed and guilty for what he did by walking off and watching his friend, which was a gang member, be killed by the opposition. And now the truth has come out about the entire situation. And as punishment for that, all of the recognition that he had received, all the accolades that he had received from the members that, of the gang that he belonged to, all the respect and all of the glory that he had received from being a member of this organization and the people that were outside the organization, how they looked at him, all of that was gone in one day. One day, one minute you're up, the next minute you're down. And now he's in protective custody. And in protective custody, especially when you're in prison, it changes the way people see you. It changes the way people treat you. Even the officers that are in protective custody, you know. Everybody sees you inside the institution as somebody that's weak and can't handle themselves on a compound. Now this put him in a bad position psychologically because he couldn't really get a hold of it. Now keep in mind, he never wanted to be a gang member. He never wanted to be a gang member. But once he became a gang member, he went all the way with it. And the things that he learned, the things that he added to his toolbox to be able to navigate the environment that he found himself in because he felt ashamed about walking away and leaving his friend to die, the things that he had learned, he maximized, and now it was gone. And that's what this life is about. And now he's standing at the door at the cell in protective custody, and as he looks out the cell, he sees a lot of faces that's standing in the window just like him. And he doesn't recognize any of those faces. These people that are in protective custody are people that he wouldn't even have any reason to be around. They were not in the circle that he was running in. And now they're looking at him, but they recognize him. And now the whispering starts to take place. All of that. You see, because the people in the back, they got an axe to grind. And they're upset. And then you got people in the back that want to do something to get back in favor of the individuals that ran them off the compound, i.e. other gang members. See, when you're in the back and you find yourself in a situation like that, you can get your props back. See, because like I say, in the penitentiary, in gangs, in the criminal lifestyle, it's about your performance. You get your accolades, you get your love, you get your respect based on the performance that you put out there. So when he was in the back and all of these eyeballs are looking at him, everybody's locked in on him while they're still locked down and people are plotting. And he felt it, but he didn't understand what was going on. He didn't understand how much he was in danger, even in protective custody. Because you, those people in the back, some of those people in the back, they were still dangerous people. They were still the type of people that can walk over your body and go straight to child, sit down and eat a three-course meal and not give second thought to just stepping over your body. It's an ugly, ugly place, even though it's the lowest of the low in the penitentiary. It's the lowest of the low. I would beg to say that it's almost as low as some of the charges that people have, and you know what I'm talking about when I say that. But when you're in protective custody, you lose all of that. So when he came out, he knew something was off. His senses were on high alert. His senses was on high alert. And it was this guy named Rob. See, Rob was a former gangster himself. And he had been sent to the back, in his opinion, based on some bogus charges. See, 
in the penitentiary if you live that lifestyle, that gangster lifestyle. See, you're not supposed to be messing with no boys. But see, Rob found himself messing with a boy and had love and admiration for him. To each his own, I say. But that's not what the organization says. It's not what they say. So when he got caught, one of the other brothers manipulated that situation and brought it to the table. And when it was brought to the table and the full issue got put on the table and, and light was shining on it, they said, you got to go. You are an embarrassment to the organization. And they pushed him to the back. And he never forgot that. But he had maintained contact with some of the brothers on the compound and other brothers around the state. And they all would tell him, bro, just give us some time and then you will be all right. Just give us some time. So now, after 18 months of sitting in the back, he was tired of staying in the back. He wanted out of that. He wanted to be back on the compound. He wanted to be back in the mix. And he saw Chile as his way to get back in the mix. Because if he could do something that would gain favor with the old, that would be seen as somebody that was law, that didn't want to tolerate what Chile did, he could get back in favor. That's what he thought. He had no idea of the seriousness of the situation. He had no idea that the decision had been made by the boss of bosses. And the boss of bosses alone made this decision. And when the boss of bosses makes a decision, no one, no one can change that. No one can alter that course. But see, Rob didn't know that. All he wanted to do was get back in good graces. He wanted to get back in good graces with the org. So he felt that this was the way to get back. So when they opened the doors and everybody on PC came out, right, they come out in, in tears. And what I mean by tears, you have 12 cells on the left side, 12 cells on the right side, right? 1 through 24. 1 through 12 gets to come out from 8 to 9. 13 through 24 gets to come out from 9 to 10. Lock back down for count. After child, then they come back out again, each side one hour at a time, separate from one another. So Rob had a problem because he lived on one side and Chili lived on the other. But every now and then, every now and then, certain officers would allow Rob to stay out, to take up the trays, empty the trays, sweep and mop the floor, and do all of the things that needed to be done. Because everybody in the back in PC wanted that few, those rare opportunities to be out in the pod so they could move around. See, that gets you favor back there. You get favor with the officers because they know that you will put in work and clean up for them. And it also gets you favor from the, the inmates that are behind the door because, you know, you can move and groove and pass things around for the guys. So he appreciated the opportunity to be able to do that. Plus, this was going to put him in a position to do what it was he wanted to do. So he started talking to Chile when he would be out. He would go to Chile's door and he would tell him he heard about him, how upstanding he was and what kind of good dude he was. And he didn't really understand why the guys did what they did to him. And Chile would talk to him and tell him, man, that's on me. Everything that they say is true. See, Chile was accepting full responsibility for the situation. He was accepting full responsibility for the situation, but Rob didn't want to hear that. Rob didn't want to accept none of that because it was going to stop him from being able to do what he wanted to do. So he did as much as he could to get Chile to trust him. He talked down about the organization. He talked down about the brother. He told, he told Chile what his situation was and how they did him wrong and how much they had in common because they had been done wrong, but Chile wasn't biting. He wasn't biting. He was accepting responsibility for what he did. So after a couple of days, Pastor T comes back to the back and he goes straight to Chile. He's talking to Chile and he's telling him about, you know, how things are going and, and how he needs to keep the faith, stay strong. Everything is going to be all right. Everything is going to be all right. And he had just gotten some good news. See, 
Chile didn't understand when he took his 20 years on one case and 20 years on the other, right? He got the total of 40. He didn't understand that this time was to be ran concurrent, not consecutive. So he had a day coming. He just needed to hold out for a few more years and he would have an opportunity to go home. He wouldn't do 40 years. He would do about 17 and five, 17 years and five months. And this excited Chile. It gave him hope. He was excited about leaving and changing his life and going on with his life. And Pastor T was coming back there every day, ministering to him and telling him, stay strong, young brother. And they fellowshiped and they talked back and forth and, and, and Chile shared what his hopes and dreams were. And Pastor T told him, you can do anything that you want to do. But Rob was laying in the cut. Rob was laying in the cut. So one day, Chile was able to get out. And he was walking around and he was going to the shower. And Rob was sweeping and mopping the floor. And he thought, this is my chance. This is my opportunity to get him. This is it. This is it. So he went back to his cell because the officer had left his cell door cracked so he could go in and out. So he went back to his cell and he had gotten a homemade pocket knife that he had made and he slid it in his back pocket. And as he was sweeping the floor, he made his way over to, to, to Chile. And when he got close enough to him, he suddenly dropped the broom, the push broom, reached in his back pocket and grabbed the knife and he swung. He swung at Chile and Chile saw it coming out of his peripheral and he dodged and it barely missed him, but Rob was on him. As Chile was backpedaling, he was swinging, and every time he swung his fist trying to get Rob up off of him, he got cut on his forearms. The officers see it, the officer hit the code. We got a fight in protective custody. All the officers on the compound that were available, they rushed to the area. And by the time they got to the area, Rob was bleeding profusely. Blood was all over the place, but he was fighting and he was swinging his arms and he was doing everything he could to keep Rob up off of him. And as he was swinging his arm, the blood was going all over the place. So when the officers walked in, they saw blood everywhere. They said, what is going on here? We have a massacre down here. And when they jumped in and they grabbed Rob and they grabbed Chili, what they found out was that he had no serious wounds to his face and his chest. These were all defensive wounds on his hands and arms. But they were serious. They were serious because he couldn't move his fingers. Rob had hit some tendons. He had fixed it to where Chili probably would never be able to use his hands again. And as they got Rob locked back down in his cell, they rushed Chili out to the hospital. When they got him out to the hospital, they figured out that the damage was not going to be permanent but it was going to be a long road of recovery with physical therapy to get him to where he could use his hands again. And they wrapped him up good and stitched him up good. He ended up with about 80 stitches. And when they got him back to the prison, they put him back in the cell and they assured him that this would not happen again. This would not happen again. As Chile said in the cell, he thought about it. He wasn't mad at all. He wasn't upset. He reminded himself, this is why I didn't want this lifestyle. I didn't want to be around these type of people. But he was friends. He was friends with D-Money. That was his friend. And he couldn't pull away from him. But as he sat in that cell and he looked at the, the bandages on his arm and he looked at the stitches that he had in his forearm and on his hands and on his fingers, he realized that sometimes... The people that you love the most can cause you the most harm. And he made a vow to himself that day that no matter who it was, if they're involved in that type of lifestyle, he was going to stay away from them because he didn't want to end up back in prison. He didn't want to end up back in prison. So later on in that week, Pastor T showed up and came and paid him a visit. And they prayed and he talked to him about what he thought about what had happened. And surprisingly, Chile was in a good mood. He was in a good mood. 
Pastor T let him know that Rob had been sent to maximum security. And on maximum security, they had a PC on that. So he had been on put on the PC inside of maximum security because the gangsters had put the word out to get him because he had went against an order that was made by the boss of the bosses. Because after that violation, nothing else was to happen to him. Nothing. And once he got on the street, it was all over. But see, Rob didn't understand that. He wanted to get back in good graces. So you got to understand something. When people go to PC, it's not necessarily over. You got a lot of people on PC with hidden agendas. They want to get back in good graces. Love in prison is based on your performance. It ain't based on you being you. And remember that. Because that's what it should be about. Now Rob had to realize that on in the hard way. Because when he got to Max and they put him on PC, a couple of the brothers bumped down on him. See, they worked in the building on Max. And they were able to get the officer to leave the door open to the PC part of Max. And they went in there and they took care of their business. And they hit him so many times, he ended up getting a hundred and some stitches all over his chest and his stomach. And he had a bag put on, had a colostomy bag put on. Because he couldn't even go to the restroom by himself anymore. And that was the fate that he had to deal with because of going against the org even though he wasn't a member anymore. Now, time is moving fast for him now. He's working out. He's getting feeling back in his hands. He's starting to feel like himself. And the warden comes back there and he talks to him. He tells him, he said, look, I got a couple of guys that I want you to tutor in the school building we have right back here in the back. See, even though you're in the back on protective custody, you still get to go to school. You still get to do those things. And he asked Chile, would he do that for him? And all the guys that he would be tutoring in the class, they were all on protective custody like him, so he wouldn't have to worry about anything. They just needed somebody like him that knew how to talk to people and tutor people to come out and be willing to help them. And at first he was reluctant to do it, but he changed his mind and he decided to come out and do it. And when he came out to do it, when he came out to do it, he was in there and he was teaching the guys what's going on. He was teaching them what's going on teaching them to read and write and arithmetic and all those different types of things. And one day, Pastor T had a surprise for him. The op that had killed his friend had volunteered to come in the back and be a tutor to the juveniles in that area to be a mentor, I'm sorry, to the juveniles in that area. And he wanted Chile to come and share in the testimony to these young guys. And Chile agreed. And as they stood up on that stage in front of those juvenile offenders and they were sharing their testimony about how they met, what it led to, and all the different things that happened to them and how they ended up in prison. They were, you could look out in the audience and you could see tears. The tears was running down these kids' faces as they realized this is not a game. This is not to be played with. They knew they had reached them. Not all, but some. And at the end of every day after they shared their testimony, they would look at each other, embrace, and then go their separate ways. They never spoke. They never spoke. Even up to the day that Chile left. And he said somehow or another, he never could find the words to express to the op how grateful he was for what he did that night in that church. Because if not for that, he wouldn't be free of all the things that he despised when he was free. Yes, he lost his friend, but that was partly because of the choices that D-Money made. And he couldn't change that. All he could do now is go forward with his life and live the kind of life that he intended to live in the first place. I hope you get something out of that. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all. I'm getting so tired.